You ever heard of Disney sequels? Love them or hate them, there were a bunch of those and they were successful. Often produced on limited budgets and riding off of the success of the original movies they were based on, the Disney direct-to-video sequels have made quite a name for themselves over the years. Disney wasn't the only company doing this sort of thing, but by sheer amount of published films, they stand out as the most notorious example of the industry. Even though the concept of these companion films has a bit of a cash grab feeling to it, that doesn't mean that they are devoid of value. The idea of a sequel isn't inherently bad, as it gives you the space to explore themes and stories beyond the original concepts, and when done right, this can lead to exceptional movies. It's nice to see how pre-established characters would respond to new situations, and it can be cool to see more content being made involving the properties you enjoy. Even if the quality of these Disney sequels varies a lot from film to film, a bunch of them have developed a bit of a fanbase. There are some works which I believe to be astounding feats of storytelling, and I have already discussed some of these cases in other videos. But even if a sequel is okay at best, it can still conquer your heart when viewed under the right circumstances. Like, The Little Mermaid 2 might not be as good as the original Little Mermaid, but it is the version that I watched the most often as a kid. For every amazing Disney sequel out there, there's twice as many that fall just short of greatness. Although they have some nice elements to them, there's still something holding them back. This is the case of the three Disney sequels I wish to explore throughout this video, highlighting their successes while also pointing out their setbacks, and maybe even thinking of how they can be improved. Can their limited qualities make them worth viewing? That's what we're about to find out. I wanna talk about Disney sequels. A few notes before we begin. I will be looking at each sequel as its own movie, though comparisons to the original are a little bit inevitable. In my opinion, none of them are up to the same standards as the movies which inspire them, but that alone does not make them bad. Things like the animation or even the voice casting will often get a downgrade from one movie to the next, and I'm not faulting them for it either. I am not here to mindlessly bash these films for not being perfect. Like I said, I intend to point out their positive traits as well as their flaws, and I do believe there is a lot to be praised. My opinion is by no means the final word on the matter, and I understand that these films can carry a special meaning for plenty of people out there. So if you're a fan of one or more of these works, please let me know how you felt about my own stance in the comments. With that said, let's look at our first film of the day, Lady and the Tram 2 Scamp's Adventure. This is the sequel to Lady and the Tramp, exploring the lives of our two titular doggos after they become part of the same family. They have a nice gang of pups to raise, but one of them takes after his father's free-spirited nature and rejects the suburban life he's been born into. Will Scamp learn the true value of family, or will he find a new destiny out in the open world? I mentioned in another video how I didn't really watch this movie growing up. I just felt like I did because I watched the trailer for it a billion times. Coming back to this film as an adult, I realize I must have seen it at least once, because I have memories of scenes that were definitely not on the trailer. Still, it apparently wasn't enough to become a regular watch as a kid. The way I see it, the original Lady and the Tramp carried a lot of subtlety. It's not a massive adventure with high stakes, it's just a quaint little movie about a couple of dogs falling in love and what this means for them in the society they inhabit. It's a very charming story with an incredibly pleasing atmosphere, and for the sequel to be successful, it would be smart of them to stick to that same vibe. And for the first couple of minutes, Scamp's adventure seems to be heading in the perfect direction, opening with a banger of a musical number. As the family strolls down the park, the town prepares for their 4th of July picnic, working hard to create a spectacular event. 
from the lyrics to the characters, everything creates an exceedingly welcoming environment, and it feels really nice to be a part of it all. You also see how Scamp is the odd one out in his pack. While the rest of the dogs act all prim and proper, Scamp wants to run around and play along, and in a way, you almost relate to his anxiety. Here is probably the loveliest town in the universe, and it would be just as lovely to explore it as you wish. But Scamp isn't allowed to do so, being dragged along and trapped at every corner, making all this excessive pleasantness seem both enticing and oppressive. And this contradiction is very well executed. And the movie goes downhill from here. Scamp resents his gated existence and idolizes the life of a street dog, not knowing that his own father had been one of the most notorious mutts in the town's history. He meets a gang of strays known as the Junkyard Dogs and decides to run away from home in order to join them. But to do that, he must first pass a series of tests imposed by the pack's leader, Buster. As Camp gets to know them, though, it becomes clear that the junkyard ruler has a complicated history with his father, so it would be best if nobody found out about Scamp's family tree. And y'all? Buster is totally the tramp's bitter ex. Okay, so Buster isn't mentioned at all in the original movie. Now, that's a common trend in these direct-to-video pieces. Regardless of that, the film still acts like Buster was part of the narrative, even if there is no evidence in the original work to suggest that's a thing. All the other street dogs are aware of the tramp and still think of him as the best stray there ever was, telling each other stories about his daring adventures and his unexplained disappearance, going as far as to say that the tramp was the reason Buster became the dog he's known as. The two were very close, and the tramp taught Buster everything there was to know about being a stray. Buster's trouble was Tramp's trouble. And Tramp's trouble was Buster's trouble, okay? Buster then angrily interrupts the gang, talking about how Tramp is actually a traitor, as the true reason why he went missing was not some heroic escapade, but because he got married. He speaks of Lady with great disdain, seeing her as the enemy who stole his companion from him, and he has never forgiven the tramp for leaving him behind. He betrayed me! When the truth comes out and Buster finds out who Scamp's dad is, the two ex-companions have a tense showdown in an alleyway where they both fight over Scamp's loyalty. And it's very obvious how, while the tramp is totally over Buster, the junkyard leader has yet to let go. Guess Buster just got jealous. You ditch me! Scamp chooses to stay with Buster, but he soon realizes that Buster doesn't want him as part of the team because he cares for Scamp's well being. What he really wants is to get back at his old partner. The bitter X vibes are just immaculate, but the rest of the story doesn't have all that much going for it. The first song is by far the best, but from this point on, the rest of the music becomes dated pop ballads. And even though we spent all that time making the town seem interesting, I still don't feel like we got to explore it all that much. Like, yeah, they roam around the streets a lot, but they never let the atmosphere sink in, you know? They're always talking over each other as they rush to their next mission. Scamp is posed as a naive kid who still has a lot to learn, and the story is motivated by his wish to become a stray, and I feel like that could have been developed better. The biggest obstacle standing in his way is Buster, because he keeps making Scamp go through pointless trials. But they never point out any of the obvious disadvantages of being a stray dog, like the need to scavenge for food, the lack of healthcare, or the precarious shelters they live under. Scamp's romanticized view of the junkyard life is never dismantled or even contested. And in that sense, I don't get why the tramp didn't tell his son about his own past as a stray. 
He later claims it's because he didn't want Scamp to chase that same life, but not telling Scamp about it is also making him want to chase it. And I feel like if the dad had told the son about the trials and perils of living without a home, Scamp would have at least thought twice before running off. This whole secrecy thing is there just to create cheap drama and it's not very interesting. In the end, the strength of the movie comes from this rivalry between Buster and the Tramp, even affecting how they treat our protagonist. Buster is still fueled by jealousy and sees Scamp as nothing but a tool, while the Tramp has moved on and treats Scamp as his own man. The town vibes stand as untapped potential, but the character dynamics still make this movie memorable. Just maybe not for the reasons the writers intended. Either way, there's a lot of fun to be had in this dog tale. Up next, we have Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas. Officially making this a Christmas video. Happy holidays, everyone. This one's technically more of a midquel, since the main story is happening within the middle of the original movie, but it's being told as a flashback from after the first movie ended, so I'm counting it as an honorary sequel here. We return to the story of Beauty and the Beast, as Belle is still living in the castle and everyone else is still under a spell. The girl is trying her best to keep her spirits up and befriend the Beast, who on the other hand seems willing to deepen their friendship, but still holds himself back because he thinks he's too monstrous to be loved. Belle wants to have a Christmas celebration, but the servants think it's a bad idea, though they don't immediately tell her why. Still determined to have her way, she decides to prepare the party in secret, and hopes that she can make the event so nice that it will cheer the beast up and make him love the holiday again. Turns out the reason why he hates Christmas is that he was cursed during that special night, which is probably the biggest retcon to the original story. The biggest criticism I see this movie getting is that the characterization of the main couple seems a bit off. Belle's strength in the first movie came from how she didn't let herself be knocked down by the beast's nasty temper, sticking to her principles and only really getting closer to him once he had started to treat her with kindness and respect. Which also showed that he was capable of being a nice guy once he put in the effort. In the sequel, Belle's entire motivation seems to be making the beast happy even if the beast himself has been nothing but a jerk to her since the start. I think the biggest setback to this film is that it was made after the original, and thus stuck to the strongest impression we had of those characters. The beast was remembered as excessively rude and still having to learn his lesson, and Belle was remembered as someone who loved the beast. So those were the characters we got even if those were not who the characters were at that point in the original story. Aside from that, I feel like the plot was just a little bit rushed. The whole story takes place on Christmas Eve, lasting 24 hours at most, and the amount of action they try to cram in in that time doesn't come off as very organic. But I'm more than willing to overlook all of those details in the name of one of the most underrated Disney villains in the company's history, Maestro Forte. This guy is iconic beyond compare. He was once the castle's composer, and ever since the curse, he's been trapped as the body of a pipe organ, chained to the wall of an adjacent room to the beast's chambers. While the rest of the staff yearns to return to their human days, Forte has found a new purpose in his instrument form, as the beast often seeks his music as comfort, and the maestro is more than happy to play him some haunting tunes. Forte knows of Belle's existence, but he sees her as a threat. If she breaks the spell, the beast will be a prince again, and his need for brooding songs will certainly diminish. Therefore, he wants to keep the girl out of his master's life, and constantly tries to foil her plans of connecting with her captor. Now, honestly, this is a villain with style. Just a completely deranged guy. Absolute dumpster fire of a moral compass. 
Forte has this really toxic relationship with the beast, trying to keep him as depressed as possible so that the master will always need his music. This works great from a character perspective too. We know that the beast's biggest flaw is that he must learn to control his temper and be kind to those around him. And now you have a guy constantly pushing him towards the opposite end of the spectrum just to fulfill his own selfish needs. And the design on this guy! They decided to animate the organ in CGI while the rest of the movie is all traditional animation, and he sticks out immediately. There's a certain uncanny quality to him, like he doesn't move quite right. The metal of his complexion seems weird and rubbery, and it's hard to get a true sense of his dimensions. It comes in part from the limitations of the technology for the time, but it just keeps on adding to the creepy vibes this dude has. He's also voiced by Tim Curry, who is the ultimate expert in sinister villain voices. Forte tricks Belle into going to the Black Forest to chop down the perfect Christmas tree, leading to a whole bunch of trouble that the Beast has to save her from. You know, for a guy who literally can't leave the room he's chained to, Forte can sure cause a whole lot of suffering. Despite the issues with Belle's characterization, I like it how both the girl and the maestro are utterly devoted to the Beast, but with completely opposite intentions. Belle wants the Beast to be happy and to realize the power that comes from being kind, while Forte wants the Beast to sink deeper and deeper into his own despair. Also, he can use magic. No wonder he doesn't want to break the curse. Belle and the Beast struggle to connect, but they finally reconcile, making Forte snap into a tantrum that threatens to tear the castle down. Master and Maestro fight it out, with the Beast ripping his keyboard off and essentially suffocating him, until Forte breaks his chain and falls face flat onto the stone floors, forever silencing his music. It's grim and violent and way more spooky than I was expecting from a Christmas special. Forte makes this movie for me. The holiday thing is merely a backdrop for his musical antics. He gets a surprising amount of screen time and not one minute of it is wasted. His manipulation of the beast is just as disturbing as his fate, and it's one of the most memorable things I've seen come out of these sequels. This enchanted castle holds more exciting stories than it seems. Ending on a more upbeat vibe, the last film I want to discuss is an extremely goofy movie, which stands as a sequel to a goofy movie. You know, the non-extreme kind. Okay, so a lot of people grew up with a goofy movie. It had a bit of a comeback a while ago, and it's considered one of Disney's underrated classics. This is a film that missed me completely when I was growing up, because whenever I stepped into my local video rental store, the cover that would catch my eye was Goofy skateboarding. In this film, Goofy's son Max is going to college, and his father really misses him. He ends up losing his job and he can't get a new one without a degree, so he decides to enroll on the same campus as his son in order to get his education and also spend more time with his boy. Max hates everything about this plan. The original Goofy movie is often praised for its sincere portrayal of a father-son relationship, dealing with the question of how to rekindle a connection that has faded as the kid grew up, and also how to conciliate the tastes of an older generation with those of a younger crowd. It's a heartwarming tale about trust and compromise, balancing bouncy and colorful scenes with heavier and quieter moments. The sequel tried adding more of everything, and it became too… extreme. Dragging your son on a summer road trip is one thing, but following him to college and invading his social life at every turn is a bit too much. Having fun with your friends and joining in on college games is all part of the freshman experience, but escaping a deadly fiery trap caused by a rocket explosion in the middle of a competition being broadcast live to national television is more than anyone bargained for. 
Boofy learns to take charge of his own life and focus on his own studies and social activities, Max learns to trust his dad more, and they all have a fun skateboarding time. But the real reason I'm talking about this movie is the college setting. Everything in this universe is exaggerated and cartoonified, and this ends up affecting the campus as well. Everyone's having the time of their lives, there's huge dorms and frat houses, and they have their own edition of the X Games? It's insane down there! I was like six years old when I watched this movie, and I barely understood what a college was. I just knew that I wanted to go there. It looks amazing! This impression is also aided by how the US college experience is a bit different than what we tend to have in my country. And even though I was later exposed to more college-centered media, I never felt the same rush I did when watching an extremely goofy movie. I want to stroll down these teen riddle streets on my skateboard. I want to go to these funky disco revival parties. I want to visit an underground slam poetry cafe and solve my conflicts through passive-aggressive finger snapping. Taking this movie to the extreme might be what harmed the story, but it's what captivated me as a kid. For years, whenever I pictured the concept of college, this is where my mind would go to. It's a version of it so impossibly idealized that it could only exist in this bouncy realm of fiction, and it's what makes me revisit this piece time and time again. Also, I still feel like this movie packs some emotional punches. Goofy goes through a nice journey of learning to have a life that doesn't revolve around his son so much, and the conclusion of the story is pretty satisfying. It's funny how Goofy became the vehicle for some of the most realistic father-son moments in Disney media, but hey, I'm not complaining. Especially not when we get so many movies of cheese looking this good. And there we have it. Three Disney sequels, each with their own appeal. While I can't help but feel like something about their premises or themes was ultimately not pushed to its full potential, there are still elements to those stories that were really well done. To the point where I catch myself thinking about them more often than I would imagine. It would be easy to dismiss those movies, saying that they have nothing to offer. But there's a lesson to be found here in how you never know how a piece of art is going to resonate with its audience, or which aspects are going to stand out to different people. Each of those movies has something that feels exceptional to me, and they strike me as a pretty fun watch. I'm sure these films have their fans, as many other underappreciated Disney sequels tend to have. If you keep an open mind, you'll find plenty of art that speaks to you and plenty of things to love. Thank you for watching. Wow, hello there. It was very nice of you to watch this video. Special thanks to my beautiful patrons for making videos like these possible. Honestly, this year was really intense and kind of messy, but you guys have been really cool and it actually helped me push through. Your support truly means a lot to me and it helps me keep this thing going. I really like making videos and the fact that there's people out there who like them enough to back me up like this is just so wonderful and I want you to know that I am incredibly grateful for it. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. So yeah, thank you so much to my patrons, and if you would like to become one of them, you can click the link in the description. But just by doing the cool things like clicking the like button and sharing this video, it already helps me out like a bunch. You can also follow me on Twitter if you want, and the link's also gonna be down in the description if you wanna click it. Uh, and feel free to leave a comment down below, especially if it is about how much you love Disney sequels. You guys always leave such nice comments, and I love reading about your memories and experiences with these movies, so thank you to all of you who have ever left a comment and helped spread the love. <laughs> I don't know, it's Christmas, uh, I am feeling very grateful today. <laughs> so, honestly, thank you. You guys are really cool. There are some people who have been following me for a very long time, and it's always nice to see your comments, and if you're new here, welcome. 
watch a bunch of my videos. They are cool. I talk about a bunch of cool stuff. Th this has certainly been a year. Thank you so much for sticking around. <laughs> and I hope that we get a lot more years in the future. This end card has been kind of a mess, but it's nice to get honest with you guys every now and then. So thank you. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! I am his confidant and his best friend. His silly rabbit. His what? His silly rabbit. His silly rabbit? Yes. Is that what he calls you? No.